Most nights, the last thing I do before I go to bed is check the pH on Amathia's garden. I get out my flashlight and take a look. Check it out, 7.86. Not so long ago, that would have said 7.68. That was starting to freak me out and I knew it was time to do something about it. Hey everybody, Reef Girl here. Well, after the crash, it's time to try again. And now I have even more incentive to get that pH in line to set the stage to make everything healthy. So I'll tell you what I did with Calc. I started researching options and as luck would have it, Reef Builders put out a video on using Calc to bump pH in their systems. So I thought, why not? Don't get me wrong, I know it's bad to chase a specific number and by no means am I looking to get 08.3, 8.4, anything like that. I'd be quite happy to consistently have somewhere around 8 and the reason for that is I want to be in the middle of a zone where it can go up or down and not cause problems. So I thought it was worthwhile to try and bump my pH so that I'd have that comfort level one way or the other if something should happen. After hearing Pat Murphy talk about daytime bubble scrubbing, I decided to add it to the nighttime bubble scrubbing I was already doing. I already had an outside airline running to my skimmer and I recently added an air stone to my sump right behind the skimmer with an airline to a pump right beside an open window. So these three things together helped bump the pH slightly, but not enough to really make me comfortable and not enough to prevent the nighttime drops to below 7.7. .7. And of course, beyond the impact of calc on pH is the impact on calcium and alkalinity. Because I'm already dosing those things, I'm going to have to start adding calc very slowly and testing frequently to make sure those things don't get out of balance. Okay, enough blabbing, let's get started. What I decided to do might be a little different from most people, but then what else is new, right? On the left is two gallons of RODI water. On the right is a huge container, as you can see the size, of ESV calcium hydroxide powder. Now I bought this years ago to start dosing in my 29 gallon cube when I knew I had to do something and I was reluctant to jump right in and start with dosing pumps and additives and all that stuff because I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. The hilarious thing about this is that to completely saturate a gallon of water with as much calcium hydroxide as it can possibly uptake takes two teaspoons of powder. <laughs> So as you can see, I have what is probably going to be a lifetime supply here. Got my safety glasses. These Billy Pipes glasses have multiple uses. I also have a mask. All right, that's fastened on my nose. Got my gloves on. All this safety stuff may seem a little bit like overkill, but since my palytoxin incident, I can't be too careful with this stuff and calcium hydroxide is highly caustic, so can cause burns when in contact with even the sweat on your hands. Now, it seems kind of ridiculous to suit up like this when I'm only gonna need two teaspoons of the stuff, but I am not taking chances anymore. Now it needs to sit for a couple of days until the mixture becomes clear and there's white sediment at the bottom. So it took several days before it reached this point where it still isn't quite clear, but what I found out in that time from doing some reading is that it's okay to use the solution if it's a little cloudy, as long as you don't use the sediments from the bottom. And one thing I didn't mention or maybe make clear was that the saturation that I decided to go with was half of the maximum. I went with this lower saturation for two reasons. The first reason was to reduce the potential for hoses to get clogged with the solution. This happens a lot. The second reason was to be able to start slowly to be in control. 
So instead of putting two teaspoons in one gallon, I put two teaspoons in two gallons. It's important to keep any container tightly sealed because carbon dioxide in the air reacts with calcium hydroxide in solution to form calcium carbonate, which is insoluble. And that's what this white skin is and these white rings are. And once it's clarified, it's not to be mixed. This white stuff will not dissolve, so the less it's disturbed, the better. Now that the mixture is clarified, it's time to get some containers ready so that I can actually start dosing. I'm going to use these two bottles, which are roughly two liters each. They used to have Pimafix and Melafix in them, and I have cleaned them thoroughly. One thing I liked about these bottles is that they came with really good caps, nice solid plastic. You can see there are two holes drilled. The large one is for the tube, and the smaller one is to equalize air pressure as the liquid is drawn out of the bottle. The small hole is small to minimize the amount of air that can get in and thus reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that contacts the calcium hydroxide solution. The black o-ring has two functions. One is that air restriction, and the second is to control the position of the tube vertically. This way it won't rest on the bottom and reduces the chance it's going to draw up solids. And why do I have two? For quick changes. I can always keep one full, ready to swap out as needed. All right, we'll make a bit of a mess here getting these bottles filled up and then I can get them by the tank and you'll see the other reason I like them so much. And here's the place they're going to go. It's a tight space, but there is room if I rearrange everything. Here's the other reason I like these bottles. They're compact. I was really excited when I saw this available in Canada for 80 bucks. It's a Camor Dripping Pro. Now this thing is meant to water plants while you're on vacation. But as soon as I saw it, I knew that it would work for what I wanted to do, for the place that I had available for it, and for the function that I wanted to carry out with it. And of course, what would any project be without something from the dollar store? This little shelf is perfect for this thing. Because of how I'm gonna be running the hoses, I needed some way to keep them in place securely. So I picked up a bag of 100 <laughs> of these little clips. Of course, I'll never use them all, but they're self-stick. In reading product reviews, I learned that people use heat to activate the adhesive to make them stick better. So that's what I'll be doing. I don't actually need these things to clip shut around the hose. I figure if I use enough of them, I'll be able to weave the hose in and out and it'll stay put. I won't actually be using the black tubing that was supplied with the pump because it's very stiff and also I can't see what's in it. I need to be sure that there aren't air bubbles trapped in the hose so that I can try and get the dose at least a little bit accurate. And check this out, the weight that came with the pump that's meant to hold the hose in the bottom of the container works to hold my ATO hose down where it should be instead of it curling up and out of the water. This is a bonus. It works perfectly. Downloading and installing the app on my iPhone was quick and easy. And then all I had to do was calibrate the pump and it was ready to go. Here's a very quick look at the app for iOS. On the left is the starting volume. On the right is the number of days, the decreasing volume, and the total daily dose. Here's my custom plan, which is alternating five milliliters and seven milliliters every two hours. So we're ready to get started and to block off the air, I just used pipettes. I cut them off at the right length to fit over top of the ends of those fittings. The one that's sticking out the side on the backup bottle, I covered the end of that one with some reef glue. So I feel pretty sure that they're reasonably airtight. It might not matter or it might not matter much, but it kind of makes me feel better as if I'm not going to get too much carbon dioxide down into these bottles. So I got the clip stuck on and did some messing around with the hose and there it is. I made a decision that that's where I wanted to have the calc come into the tank because it's right at the overflow and any that doesn't get drawn down to the overflow will not really disperse anywhere in the tank that's going to hurt anything. 
There's where the tube runs along the back and I've alternated those clips facing up and down so I could weave it through them. So really, it turned out pretty good. To start with, I programmed the app to dispense five milliliters of the calc solution every two hours on the 45 minute mark. After purging the air, which took about 30 seconds, it's ready to go. It only took about three days for the pH to start consistently reading eight. This reading was taken at around nine o'clock at night and I couldn't be more pleased. I haven't noticed a huge impact on calcium and alkalinity. They're pretty much stable. And at this point, I've been dosing calc for about two weeks. So it turns out I have a problem to solve. It took over a month for the contents of this bottle to get down this low. There's about an inch left. I only had 1600 milliliters in this bottle and at a dose of 60 milliliters per day, it should have got used up way quicker than that. Uh, according to the dosing calculator on the Camor app, it should have taken 27 days and it took more like 36 or 37 days. So obviously air was getting in and really I should have known because I did see air bubbles in the hose, but I didn't think there were a lot of air bubbles. So what this meant was that the dose that it was actually getting was lower than what I thought it was getting. This is okay because it was still achieving the goal I was looking for, which was getting the pH up. It might explain why the calcium and alkalinity weren't really impacted all that much. So I swapped over to the fresh bottle and I came up with a jankety solution involving a lot of scotch tape around the fitting and around the pipette. This seemed to work. I purged the air out of the lines and I noticed that the bubbles were still kind of present, but there weren't very many of them. Over the next week or so, I monitored it and the dosing quantity was much more consistent. There were fewer bubbles, but they were still there. So I came up with a different solution. I decided the best thing to do was eliminate the fittings and put a hose directly into the fluid. These hoses are constantly bending, so I got this pipette and cut it appropriately so that I could put the hose over the small end. I think I cut up more of these pipettes to use for other stuff than I actually use them as pipettes. <laughs> so this tube is 30 inches long, which is the distance from the hose connection on the pump head down to the bottom of the bottle. So all I need to do is slip this hose over top of the pipette and then I can get it threaded through the cap, get the O-ring in place and get it into the fluid. So I've set it up here on top of the book so I can keep a close eye on it. You can see the pipette down in the bottom there. It's a little bit above the bottom, so I think it should be okay. I shouldn't have to mess with it too much. I've already purged the air and I've looked very closely. I don't see any bubbles in here at all. Great timing. A couple minutes later, it deployed and here we go. Just caught the end of it. So it looks like it's working just fine. And as a reward for sticking around to the end while I wrap this up, take a look at this little slice of life from Mollywood. The feed hose modification was a success. And after testing, I've adjusted the custom plan to what I showed you earlier in the video, five and seven milliliters alternating every two hours. In fact, the other day, I even saw an 8.1.